coming up on UGTV. A special session of the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. Go ahead and get our meeting started. We'll ask the clerk to announce the meeting and call the roll. A special session has been held on Thursday, April 14th, 2016 at 5 o'clock p.m. Fifth floor conference room for a jail study follow-up. Roll call. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. Mugia? Here. Johnson? Here. Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Holland. Here. All right, we are having the follow-up for the jail study. You might remember um, that we made a commitment a couple years ago to study all of our public safety departments in depth. Uh, we um, are still working on the fire study. We now have the jail study um, that is completed, and now we're looking at implementation. And the police study will get underway later this year. So uh, the studies are moving along um, as we expected. We do have, I do want to recognize um, Jerry Gorman, our district attorney, who is here, and um, Judge York and Judge Ryan, who are here. Thank you for being here. And we have Jeff Fuel here, who is our um, jail administrator, and of course the sheriff and our um, and the lead on our um, jail study. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to Doug. Do you have any comments, or do you want to? Quick comment. I mean, as the sheriff goes into the study tonight, it's really key is we're moving into next week we're having our strategic plan where we're thinking about the budget thinking about those items this is really one key area as you go through and listen to the study and the steps we're at now um, that you know I'll be looking for that direction as to which way we want to go with this and um, you know because it doesn't come free to make all these steps where we need to look at as far as the needs we have in the in the jail and a future juvenile detention facility. So understanding where we're going with that as we start to work on and build budget would probably be direction that we'd be looking for coming out of this. Um, not
not that we're looking for any formal votes, yes or no, but it's kind of, is this the direction we want to go or no, we're not looking to go in that direction and then we have to formulate financing from there. So with that, Mayor, I'll turn it over to Sheriff Ash and let you do the presentation. All right, thank you, Doug. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here. I'm going to give you 60 seconds or less on how we got here. Um, so this jail, 53, $54 million jail, was constructed in the late 80s, 1990, and opened as the county jail, just the county jail for adult felony inmates. Um, subsequent to it opening, uh, two things happened. One uh, was that the Caw Valley Juvenile Detention Home, we called it, Juvenile Detention Center, uh, which is where law enforcement took juvenile offenders, uh, got condemned, I believe, and was forced to close. That created a problem about what to do with the juveniles. The uh, decision was made at that time to take one of the housing units, a de-housing unit from the adult jail, and what was originally designed as the release desk and the release center, turn that to uh, intake booking and release for juveniles and house them in that um, housing unit, which is embedded, of course, in the adult jail. The second thing that happened, or third thing that happened subsequent to that was at unification, when the police jail, when the municipal jail closed, that was located down right off the VIP lot of this building, um, all of that um, work was shifted over to the county jail. We had just one jail facility. So that's how we got where we are here today. You've seen the study. We, we did that presentation the 28th. You've had the full study, however you've gone through it or not. What we're here today is to focus on what we believe are the, the main critical issues there and what we'll refer to as phase one. There were multi-phases and a, a big scope of work that was presented. We're going to recommend to you based on our analysis and study of that, what we believe is what we do now, is what we do in the immediate and foreseeable future. So with that, I'm going to reintroduce Mr. Dan Rowe with Trainer Architects, and he's going to take us through the presentation. We have lots of slides. We are not planning on using them all, okay? We are, we, we've got to be out here at 545. We're going to go through a number of them. We're going to open it up to your questions. And if we need any of those slides to illustrate or, or answer some of those questions, we'll have them. So, Dan. Thank you, Sheriff, and thank you, Commissioners. We, uh, while I do plan to only take about 20 minutes or so to cover this information so that there's questions and time for that, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as we go. As the Sheriff indicated, we've studied a lot of information in very high detail, and we have some backup information uh, that can support but would like to make sure that the, the message uh, is clear. So again, as the sheriff had indicated, uh, that study that was completed <clears throat> did a space needs projection, and there's a slight increase over time that's going to occur in all likelihood with your jail numbers, but not a drastic increase. You guys have done an excellent job of continuing to keep those numbers down, um, and a slight decrease over time in your juvenile numbers. So. You guys are doing a lot of very good things as a, as a county to, uh, to reduce your jail and juvenile populations. And so this part of the study was to say, from those recommendations, how do we begin and what would be the necessities of implementing the first portions of that study, which would be to bring the farm out inmates back into the county jail, which would maximize the use of the existing facility and begin a process for creating a new juvenile separate detention facility. I uh, would like to talk a little bit about why that, again, the separation of the juvenile is an essential part of this plan. Uh, and then to uh, take that area that's currently used in the facility for juvenile and reconvert that back to the adult facility. Um, there's some things that are happening. Uh, some of them are very, very recent. One of the things that has happened is the state of Kansas passed Senate Bill uh, 367 um, that changed the way in which juvenile detention is administered by counties and by the state. Uh, the intent was to create consistencies across the system um, and to create a graduated response. So instead of immediately taking a juvenile to detention uh, to reduce those detention numbers, it, it begins to create a programs-based 
and currently uh, intended to be state-funded programs-based systems that will deter uh, juveniles from the detention and from the incarceration system. So as, a, as an intent, and that the changes uh, are, are very impactful. Also, realizing the, the, the implications of isolation for any juvenile held in detention to reduce that isolation. The impact uh, will be a continued reduction in your juvenile detention numbers, which is a really good thing for the community and for, the, for, uh, for everyone involved. But the issue that you have is there will be program space needs increase. And your juvenile facility is currently surrounded by jail space, so there's no way to implement those programs within your juvenile detention. Um, you will have larger intake and probation numbers because instead of having a, a technical violation of a probation, uh, which normally would result in that juvenile going back into detention, there's a longer period of three technical violations before that occurs and some other things that will, that will put different types of stresses on your system. But specifically, your juvenile detention system is not very program-based right now. It's very detention in a cell-based. And because it's in an adult facility, the other issue is that your adult jail was designed to have an inflow and an outflow. Generally, people don't escape from jail anymore by tunneling through a wall. Generally, what happens is a mistake that's made because people coming into the facility and people leaving the facility are in the same location and their identity is mistaken. So having right now uh, a booking facility in your adult facility that has people entering the jail being arrested and people exiting the jail being released in the same area is a dangerous situation that should be remedied as well, that can be remedied as soon as the juvenile intake area is removed from the adult jail. So it is a very uh, important part of that, and we'll come back to that. The second part of that is the emphasis that has been placed in Senate Bill 367 on where juveniles may and may not be held. Um, it is open to some interpretation as to when you can co-locate jail and juvenile functions on the same site. Uh, as you can read, however, I think that there's clarification that is being made that could create a situation that would not allow you to house them in the same way in which you are. It states pretty clearly that after January 1, 2017, no juvenile shall be detained in a place um, or placed in a jail pursuant. The question is, is do you have adequate separation within the facility as you have it designed? I think that is a very open interpretation. So I'm not saying that you are or will be in violation of that law, but it is something that is being taken seriously as ACA and most other normal juvenile and corrections groups strongly suggest the separation of juvenile from adults. So I think it is something that is going to be reemphasized through the Senate bill that you should be looking at very carefully if in fact you do not take steps to move your juvenile to a separate facility. Um, so the, an overview of the solution is, is that the, the county currently farms out about uh, anywhere from 72 to 108 inmates. It's, uh, you're budgeted right now at $2,096,000 within the sheriff's budget. Uh, that turns out about $174,000 of average monthly expense for that, for that occurrence. This has been going on for some time, and, and this is simply a chart that I think you've seen before in the past about how much money has been spent over time, over $40 million in the past 30 years, to spend uh, housing inmates out. The good news is your number is dropping. It's, it's been a very good progress to remove those people and to bring those back and to decrease that expense that has been as high as four and a half million dollars at, at, uh, in a one year. It's leveling out now at about that two million mark, which is your current budget. Um, there are projections that that should stay sl steady or slightly reduce as you continue to lower your, your inmate uh, population. <clears throat> so to bring inmates back into the facility, one of the ways in which we're going to be able to do that is to double bunk some areas of the jail facility that can't allow that space. To do so, you need an additional officer in those housing units to be safe so that one officer isn't shepherding too many people within that housing area. So it does mean hiring officers uh, because of the medical attention and other things. There are other staff, both, um, both detention and non-detention staff that will need to be hired in order to serve the larger number of, of inmates. That total expense for that is about an $85,000 a month expense. 
Uh, there's also some supply cost, and this is more to illustrate to you that we've really turned over every rock about what cost would incur from the county from bringing everybody back. There's been a lot of talk about how much does out of county cost versus in county cost. And so what we did was to make sure that all the costs associated with bringing an inmate back from they're going to need shoes to the toothpaste to the, all the detail of that has been studied. Um, and some small one-time capital expenses, officer uniforms. So again, we looked in detail at the cost of those. In a nutshell, what we found is that your current monthly farm out expenses of $174,000, you have an increased staffing expense of $85,000 and inmate expenses of food and other, other uh, incidentals of about 20000 you then would be able to save by housing the same number of inmates back inside your existing facility about sixty-eight, almost $69,000 a month or approximately $824,000 per year. That is after the expense of the staff and all the expenses you would incur. So it is less expensive for you to house them in your county jail than outside of your county jail by that much. What we went through was we went through a lot of cash flow projections about when it would take and how long would it take to hire the officers to get them on board, bring them on, get them trained, hire the medical staff, how long would it take, when would it occur, so how long would this process take is really what we focused on in very, in very intricate detail. What we found is about nine months from the time in which you decide to make this decision until the time that you have all the inmates back. They can be moved back in pieces and parts as you train some officers. So there's a lot of detail in this, and if you're interested, we can get into it. But in about a nine-month period, you would be able to take, hire the officers necessary, train them, get them on staff, and bring your farm outs back. So it won't happen overnight, but it can happen in a, in a relatively short period of time. That process costs about $125,000 more than you will save during that nine months. So there is an investment in it, at the end of which, after that ninth month, then you begin to have that savings of about that eighty-four to eighty-five thousand dollars a month, or excuse me, sixty-eight thousand dollars a month, eight hundred and twenty-four thousand a year. The other thing to note is that your bed space, um, four hundred and sixty-nine total beds, has a male and female, and so one of the things to recognize is, is that this has an impact on male beds, but female beds and availability changes. So. Uh, double bunking those beds will give you about 421 beds of male beds available. <clears throat> and as you bring back the farm outs, with the farm outs back, you have an average daily population of male inmates between 380 and 390. So when you have some peaking, which is the weekends, the number of inmates goes up, and classification in order to class classify them in minimum, medium, maximum, you have a number of beds required ideally at, at 432. Going backwards, what I'm saying is that you're effectually full when you bring inmates back. So this is a temporary solution until the juvenile center can be built. Once one backfills the juvenile space, you will have 493 male beds available and therefore once you are able to backfill the juvenile space, your pressure is relieved. You have a more ability to not only have your peaking factors met, but you also then have the ability to any fluctuations in growth that may occur in the next few years. So as a solution, this process will work extremely well. Part of what we then wanted to look at was exactly what would a juvenile center cost? Uh, this is information that was in the uh, study originally which is a construction value to construct 48, uh, a 48 bed jail, uh, would, would cost about uh, 18.6 million total project cost. Um, your finance department has uh, run some calculations that would, uh, it would require about 1 million to 1.2 million dollars per year to debt service that over a 30 year period keeping in mind you have about $824,000 of savings from farm outs. So you get a long way to getting that facility afforded through the savings, but you don't get all the way there. Um, so what we recognized, however, is what Senate Bill um, 367 also does <coughs> is that 
reemphasizes from jail beds, your, your number of juvenile beds should go down, in fact, but your program space needs can go up, areas for classrooms and areas to administer the outside of detention programs. So we're suggesting that a 40 bed facility that may have the same area, but in order to allow for future expansion internally, would be able to have more classroom type space, which is less expensive uh, than cell type of space. And we believe that that facility could cost as little as about 16.2. The amortization numbers are still being discussed, but that would lower that down and get that closer to being met to the savings. But we don't have those numbers just yet. Um, there are also some, some maintenance items, and I know that there's been uh, a lot of talk about the deferred maintenance as it was in our report, and I want to make something very clear. You guys have actually taken pretty good care of this building. The maintenance that's been done on this building has kept it very functional for 30 years. So when, when we refer to deferred maintenance, uh, don't take that as a detriment to either your maintenance staff or your attention to taking care of this building. It's actually a very, very good shape for a building. What you're saying is, is that the building is now 30 years old, so your chiller is 30 years old, your, your, your equipment are 30 years old, your roof's 30 years old. So those things kind of defer out, because you don't want to replace the roof at 15 years, you wait until it needs replacement. So when we say deferred maintenance, the roof needs to be replaced, only a portion of it has. The elevators, you don't replace them regularly at 10 years or 15 years. You wait until they begin to have problems in the wear out, and, and that's what's occurred within this facility. It's reached that time period within its life that it needs these things taken care of. So that list, in order to get the building taken care of, is different from the list that was in our uh, study that included the renovation cost of coming back into the juvenile and fixing that. So the, these items to, to get the elevators replaced, the generator, the chiller, and, and the roof, and those things that are essential to function need to occur regardless of what you do with the juvenile center or the expansion or bringing farm outs back. These things are, are of, of critical importance to the facility. Uh, but there's about $2.7 million worth of work that needs to occur in there. Whether you budget that over time through amortizing uh, maintenance budget over time, or whether you capitalize that as part of a project. That would be something that you would strategize depending upon how you would debt service. With that, in summary, uh, the concept here is to bring those farm out inmates back into the county, which would save uh, a substantial amount of money, uh, projecting about $825,000 uh, to the county in savings, and then to utilize that savings to construct a new separate juvenile facility so that you can have those separate facilities operating properly. Um, and that would also give you then the ability to have the expansion space needed for the jail and have the jail totally separated from juvenile, which would, in our opinion, be essential. Um, and then obviously complete the needed facility maintenance upgrades and then continue to budget for ongoing maintenance pro projects on an annual basis um, uh, as you see those coming around. And that is the conclusion of our presentation. And um, again, I think that uh, I want to applaud the staff uh, of the jail and those we've been working with. Uh, they really have done a, a very excellent job of, of getting us numbers of operational costs and, and allowed us to really get down to um, a very precise detail on this. All right. Um, questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Bynum. And uh, please, everyone, uh, please use the microphone so everyone at home can hear. Uh, first of all, thanks for the update. It's, it is an enormous amount of work, and we really do appreciate you putting it all together and bringing it to us in a way that we can understand. I have two questions. What's the interim uh, plan for juveniles during a construction process? Should we proceed with a, with a new facility? Yeah. And can you tell us again... Sheriff, uh, the proposed location of, of such a new facility? So the, the proposed, the interim plan is to continue status quo. Now, unless something adverse happens in response to Senate Bill 367 and somebody interprets and opines, opines legally that, uh, no, you can't continue to, you know, to house them there, then we're going to have to you know, figure out what we do. 
And so, like Dan said, that's sort of open to interpretation right now. Some people are interpreting it one way. Some people may in interpret it another way. The proposed site is behind the um, court services building, what we refer to as the 812 court building, um, in, that, in what is mostly parking area right now is the, the preferred proposed site. Commissioner Walker. Why would we prefer that site over the site behind Memorial Hall that was acquired 25 years ago with the idea of building on that? Uh, it, this being a public purpose, it's only a half a dozen houses left. And that parking lot, well, I guess I don't know the numbers on it. it there does seem to be a quite a bit of use to that parking. Why would you not want to build it over here? Um, the, one of the main purposes would be to assist us in um, transport or to cut down or eliminate what some current transport costs that we have now. So now we need to load juveniles and some adults because there are a couple of adult courts rooms over there. We need to load them in a van and take them over there and drive them in the bullpen and shut the gate and you know usher them in and out. Um, constructing it over there would give us an opportunity to architecturally design in a transport corridor so that they would not have to be taken outside, if you will. Uh, so that's, that's the primary reason and the, and the main reason there would be continued uh, safety and security for the juveniles going back and forth to court as well as staff uh, transporting and then depending on there was an option presented to possibly consider constructing a parking lot under the new juvenile detention facility to help recover some of those parking spaces. And once again, that would allow us to increase security for certainly the elected judges that serve in that building there, which we have a, a concern about. Uh, security it's a whole another separate issue that we're dealing with but it would be one that we could address should we choose uh, that option well, let me you need a microphone sir let me follow that up with just one more question then unless the dynamics have changed where the juvenile court is located is really not set in stone I mean juveniles were brought over to this courthouse for many years before the federal government abandoned that building to us. And it seems like to me that, you know, your, your concern here uh, with juveniles is less than what it, you're, you're transporting adults today from the jail over to that courthouse. I don't know that all of them are being transported there, but at least it used to be in Dexter Burdett's courtroom still over there in West Griffins. And so you're, you're taking a higher level offender across the street in open with the security being the two officers, I assume, that are taking him. That, that doesn't, that it would be my priority to keep those offenders less likely to escape. What, what are we protecting the juveniles from? I mean, you, you're talking about, well, you, you get my point. Yeah. I, we're, 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 we're trying to put safety for juveniles over the safety of the officers and the public. I mean, if you were gonna break somebody out when they're being transported across the street, seems like to me, where you roll up with your guns and start shooting, and, am I wrong? I think that the uh, obviously the objective would be to remove uh, or eliminate, if possible, all of the transportation from a van across a very short distance because it is very staff and, and costly to do so. Um, the fact that you're doing it with both adult and juvenile, by moving the juvenile out, can remove a large portion of that transportation. Uh, the solution for the adult would simply to make sure that that adult court was actually taking place within the courts, so it'd be a remodeling within the court later that would 
try to separate the adult and the juvenile, but, but this, would, uh, uh, this would reduce the juvenile traffic uh, that would have to get into a van to go to court. So all juvenile traffic could then go to the juvenile court uh, just by escorting uh, inside a secure environment. And, Thank you, and I might offer too, I think, to the commissioner's point that if we get direction that we want to move forward in this direction, I think final decisions on where this goes and how it locates would still be something that needs to come forward and make a decision on. I know this is a recommendation and where we think is the best place now, but I think that's part of what could be matured a little bit more and, and that may be still something to come back as we further evaluate. I, I think where we need to get to now is do we want to go in this direction to make a decision to make this happen and then push harder on some of those <coughs> I like the concept to where we have the garage underneath. I think there's some restrictions that, that uh, like the kids, the people can't see the kids while they're in there. You know, so the location of where that's at is, is pretty defined area, so the outside folks couldn't see the kids. You know, so there's things that I think maybe we forgot that the kids can't be seen and some other stuff. So I, I like the idea. I think it's great that, that, that uh, it looks like we can bring back enough money to, to with little money of ours to make this work and then go along with what they've told us to do in Topeka and, and I think the sooner we start on this before somebody tells us that you're behind you've done it wrong and it's going to cost you twice as much if you don't start doing it right now Commissioner Townsend thank you uh, Mr. Rowe uh, is the first bullet point up there bringing back the farm outs contingent or not upon us moving the juveniles? No. Uh, no. You, you can double bunk the areas of the adult facility and bring them back. The, the only difficulty or, or contingency I would say is that fills your facility to an effective capacity. So the pressure relief from that effective capacity is a continued hope that the number of adult inmates declines or to have the juveniles move out and to, and to use that space for adults. So, but they are not, they're not mutually exclusive or depend upon each other to a do. Okay, thank you. And this would be part of the logistics, right? If we decided to move forward, it might be that we build and complete the juvenile facility, move the juveniles out, renovate the juvenile existing place, and even rotate our current inmate population down and then fix another pod to where it needs to be and then move everybody back. So it could be, it would have to be staged and you'd have to work out the logistics for Certainly, there's, there's other ways in which it can be done. Each has a different financial impact. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Rowe, for this comprehensive report. Um, did I see somewhere in there that there was, uh, that there were some community programming um, included in, in, in these numbers or, or no? I think it was towards the beginning of the presentation. And the what I'm trying to get to is, is there it, it, trying to identify what the cost would be for the community-based programming, particularly as it relates to staff. Yes, there's not any community-based programmings that are paying for the programming itself. What we did was to take the dollars that would have otherwise been accounted for for detention beds and place that into programming areas that could be used for those programs. Um, the indication that you're probably uh, talking about is is that within Senate Bill 367, uh, the state is allocating, I uh, don't have it right here with me, but the state is allocating a large sum of money, and I believe in fiscal year 17 is upwards of $8 million for statewide programs that would be done on this. Um, I'm not, I'm not advocating or disadvocating Senate Bill 367 because there's a lot of debate about whether it's good and healthy and there's a lot of good things about it that does a lot of good things for juvenile detention and, and there's a lot of concern that, that the state may not fund that in the future. But, but establishing those programs is an excellent way in which to defer and deter people away from the detention environment. So it is trying to, uh, uh, with its impact, trying to get kids out of detention and into program-based things that the state is hoping to save money through not having statewide detention dollars that they are spending in the post-adjudicated system in order to say, take that money that they save and put it to these 
pre-adjudicated and deferral programs. So that's the intent of it. So there's no guarantee that it's going to be there, but the assumption it sounds like is that our plan is to, to, to look into leveraging those, those dollars in our system. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I think that what is going to be there is the mandate from the state to move to these programs such that you can defer kids out of detention. So those, those mandates about having the judiciary look at um, uh, diversion programs and to have the judiciary looking at ways in which if you're a technical violator that you're not going to go back into detention, that you're into a different program, are going to be imposed by the state uh, and hopefully funded by the state. Last question is, 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 has there been any discussion as to what would happen if they decide to cut this? I mean, we know that in the, in the uh, corrections department, they've, they've undergone millions of dollars of cuts over the past, I don't know how many years. Is there any thought as to what the plan B might be? Because I think that the recommendation is that we would look towards implementing some type of program. Uh, you are correct. And I don't know that there is a plan B or what would happen if, in fact, funding savings didn't occur. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, the, the premise is that uh, the, this law will result in about a $72 million reduction in state costs for incarcerating juveniles. That that money could then be funneled to state-funded evidence-based community programs rather than detention. The two scariest words on that slide in the current environment in Topeka are state-funded. I think everybody here understands that. Right. <laughs> yes, all too well. Uh, Commissioner Walker. Your, your model, if I followed it, was that by doing this, we're going to bring the pharma back to the jail facility and that we will then have a separate facility. Uh, you know, when that jail was built, it was built with the idea that it large enough that it would hold any capacity of, uh, of inmates long into the future that we, we had. And if I recall correctly, it wasn't a matter of a few years before the jail was full. And your model and numbers are predicated on, it looks like, I guess the question to make, to be brief, have you built into these numbers the, the the future, I mean, my experience in life has been jails get larger and fuller, not smaller, not more, more space accommodating. So if we do this and we're at 420, give or take, eventually we're going to have to start farming them out again. And I didn't see any numbers built in there as to how that impacts the overall cost factor. I mean. If you follow what our experience has been, it, it, in 10 years, it, there may be 600 people in jail at any given time. So do you have a response to that? Yeah, yes, and, and you are correct. And again, having done jails, courts, and juveniles exclusively for the past 20 years, I know exactly what you're talking about. A typical trend is, is between 6 and 8% increase per year for the longest time. Um, Carter Goble Lee, who did the study, uh, also recognized that it, uh, with the recession in 2008 began a, a steep decline in numbers of inmates, largely driven by the affordability of states and cities and counties to afford the ability to incarcerate. So just like what you guys have experienced, other counties have experienced the inability to afford to incarcerate and therefore have strongly looked at, at, at programs like what you're doing with Brenda Liker, who's looking every week at how many people can be deterred away from and how many people can get out of jail who are not a danger to society. So what's happened is a, a concerted effort to reduce the jail population, both by a conservative nature of saving money and by a liberal nature of wanting to reduce the population of jails. Um, what we're seeing is a national trend, both on jails and prisons, of a reduced population as a concerted effort of local, federal, and state governments. So. It is a concerted effort that is making this. If that concerted effort stops or declines or changes, the numbers can go back up and will go up. What Carter Goble has based on their, on their modeling is three different models. One that assumes the worst case, 
one that assumes the best case, and then models about five different statistical analyses between those to come up with the projections of a slight two to three percent increase over time here for the next five to ten years. Um, inside our program, our, um, our study, is also ways in which as that number increases, you can add on to this facility or add adjacent in the land that you had described earlier for, for future jail for minimum security, because your jail right now is very well designed for a maximum and medium facility. Uh, so having a lower uh, level offender being able to do a dormitory style setting across the street might be a very viable way in which it can expand in the future. So I don't think you're done expanding your jail. I wish you were. I hope you're done expanding your jail in my career. But, uh, but that being said, there's really no guarantee to the numbers. Carter Global Lee used the best statistical data they had. Uh, I don't think you're going to see a 7 to 10 percent increase because I don't think it's financially sustainable for counties to do it. Those numbers are in the full study, so they are there. What we're talking about in this is Mayor asked us to look how would we move forward and how could we break this up into sort of elephant bite-sized chunks that we could eat at one time. This deals with simply one of what I believe were seven or eight phases in the full study. Well, and I, that's a key part of my uh, piece. I do agree we need to move forward with a juvenile detention center. Um, I want to get our kids out of prison and on track to better community-based programming. Um, I don't think there are only a handful of kids that need to be in a maximum security setting. Um, the others are only learning how to be in the maximum security setting, and I think we would do better to get get kids on a reform track faster um, in a facility that has step-down care in it um, with, the, with the, <coughs> the, all the needs in one facility. I do think, um, I think we have greater needs across the street than this first phase addresses. I mean, I do think we need, we have a lot of deferred maintenance we need to take on. We need to continue the double bunking to bring the farm outs back and we need the new juvenile system. I do agree those are the first three priorities that we need to tackle with a sense of urgency. Uh, the other piece I want to make sure we don't lose sight of is I think we could do better um, than that federal courthouse building that we inherited. Um, I think long term or even medium term, I'd like to see that come down and I'd like to see us build a facility over there that would provide better customer service for our community um, better access and handicap accessibility for jurors um, as, as jury screening, um, looking at um, the kind of community corrections instead of just expanding jail space, expanding our community corrections, staffing, and space. They're crammed in there right now um, in, a, in a building that's probably past its useful life. So I'd like to see the next stage starting to take shape as well. The other piece is we have the most beautiful piece of architecture in our entire community in the courthouse, in a 100-year-old courthouse, um, that is in significant need of renovation. Um, and we're wasting the top two floors um, because we're just not, they're just not usable right now with the old jail up there. Um, that needs to be completely rehabbed. Um, the other thing that Judge Lamson was talking about, and this would be a great study for the court side to take on, which is, you know, a lot of communities go to shared, um, shared space for their courtrooms. So you have a large, couple large courtrooms, couple medium-sized courtrooms, couple of, and more small courtrooms, because most courtroom activity doesn't need a giant theater. Um, you, the needs of that are limited. To look at how we could better use our courtroom space in that great architecture. So, I want to. I think we need to move forward for this. I think we also need to move forward with getting some design concepts and getting the court thinking about what would be the optimal space for the next 50 years of operation, um, to how to best, in terms of the transport issues um, and the long-term sustainability of our court system um, and much needed upgrades to those facilities. So, but those are big dollar items as well. Um, you know, we could add this much again um, because by the time you do parking and everything you're talking about, we're at $24 million. Um, we could do that much again, renovating that and building a new building. So thoughts that I want to put on the table, I just don't want us to think that we're done across the street once we do this, that we have, we have significantly more needs yet. 
and the same low budget. <laughs> High needs, low income, <coughs> typical city story. So, all right, anything else from the commissioners? <coughs> um, is there um, consensus in terms of direction for our administrator to look into building this into our CMIP budget for this summer? I don't see any terrible opposition. Um, anybody very excited about it? Or just. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> but I'm afraid to get too happy. No, that's right. All right, so that's the direction. We're going to work this in. And um, I'd like to see a plan on what phase two and three might look like so we can keep that in the back of our mind as well. All right, we are adjourned downstairs. We have a police graduation at 6 o'clock um, and then our regular commission meeting at 7. <laughs>